स्थापकाय च धर्म से सर्वधर्मस्वरूपिणे अवतारवरिष्ठा रामकृष्णा ते नम श्रुतिस्मृतिपुरा आलय करुणाल नमा भगवत्द शंकर लोकशंक सो वी आर बिगिनिंग दि दिस् रिट्रीट डिस्कशन द नेम ऑफ द टेक्स्ट ईज दृक् दृश्य विवेक सो मे बी इन इंग्लिश वी कैन से इट इस कैंड ऑफ डिसर्णिंग विस्डम दट हेल्प्स टू अंडरस्टैंड दि सीयर द पर्स्यूअर and is seen and perceived this may sound very abstract almost unintelligible but when we enter the text it becomes very simple you you understand it's part of our own life there is nothing uh, very abstract about it the text uh, has got 46 verses in sanskrit and uh, generally conventionally it is known to be a, an important introductory work a primer on advaita vedanta non dualistic philosophy that's how it is understood it is important because it is very short and very highly condensed and it contains uh, all the important philosophical ideas of advaita vedanta in a nutshell uh, uh, by scholarly tradition it is uh, supposed to be a work written by adi shankara acharya himself but there are different views and according to some other um, scholars uh, it was written by a monk a great monk who belonged to shankaracharya tradition who was a follower of shankaracharya in bharati tirtha he was a, he was the abbot of uh, one of the uh, mats one of the ashramas one of the monasteries uh, founded by shankaracharya singeri mats in the name bharati tirtha is the name of the great monk whose name is frequently referred to as a possible author of this work the uh, according to scholarly tradition it is essentially a work by shankaracharya now um, i shall just give a nutshell of what this uh, book deals with now we all frequently identify ourselves with this body or the mind or the intellect in a way we all identify ourselves this body mind complex this body mind mechanism when we uh, face a problem at the physical level an illness for example we become upset because we think we are this body so if the body fall sick we can be fall sick or i fall sick when i my, my body fall sick now there are examples where great philosophers scientists and thinkers who were born physically handicapped who were uh, in a way who lived like vegetables who physically from a physical perspective they were totally incapable of live, doing anything in this world so stephen hawking for example now how could a man like him a scientist who did not believe in god who would not have taken seriously this book we are discussing now but the book discusses about him he may not accept this that this book has something to be, to say about a man like him so the book tells you when you lift your own level of awareness your own interpretation of who you are beyond the body say to the level of mind or intellect then bodily problems are no more problems for you because you have a 
you may not uh, philosophically or spiritually interpret it that way, but if you are able to, oh, body will come and go, I don't have to worry, I have to do my work. You're actually unconsciously, without you being aware of it, you are transcending the bodily dimension. Otherwise, the slightest stomach ache, headache, or anything will completely will crush you. But thinking people, educated people, won't take it very seriously. At least for that time, they lift themselves beyond the physical, beyond the earthly, the empirical. So that's why he could do so much, in spite of being physically totally handicapped. Many people would not be able to survive like that. Now, the text tells you, suppose you can lift yourself beyond even intellect and mind. So intellect and mind also undergo problems, psychiatric problems, emotional problems, anxiety, neurosis, depression, phobias. Uh, uh, all these problems affect the mind and intellect. Mind waivers. Emotions sometimes disturb our mind. Our attitudes, our mental world becomes highly disturbed. Mind can be your worst enemy if you, uh, if you are a slave of your mind. Mind can be your best friend if mind becomes your slave. If you listen to the dictations of the mind, the mind will become a dictator. It will become a tormentor. But if you can befriend your mind by restraining your mind, the mind can be your best friend, philosopher and guide. So this text tells you, you can even elevate yourself beyond the mind by, by turning your mind into a tool in, in your hands and not becoming a tool in the hands of your own mind. And that is possible by linking mind to something that, is, that even transcends mind. That is called Atman as, the, as a divine reality present in all of us. Now, how to identify ourselves with this Atman? In fact, uh, frequently uh, I used to repeat here very often, you know, psychological problems, or psychiatric problems, do not have permanent remedies or solutions at psychological level. If you want a healthy mind, you have to be on, go beyond mind. Uh, you have to link your mind to something that never falls sick. That is Atman. That never feels anxiety or neurosis or anything. So, when you are talking about seer, the perceiver, the witness, the subject, you are talking about something, somebody present in all of us. That, that is not the mind, body, or intellect, but behind and beyond all this, the seer, it's called, in Sanskrit, it's called drashta. The drashta actually literally means the seer, the one who sees. That's the meaning of drashta. Drugdha, it means to see, to perceive, to recognize. So, the text tells you there is one drashta, one perceiver, one witness, non-participating witness. The subject, which is never objectified in all of us. That's our true identity. All other identities are empirical. Other identities are not wrong, but when you really go in search of the truth behind this body, this mind, and in this intellect, then if you are a philosopher, or if you, want, if you meditate, then finally you will knock at the door of the real I. And that is the all-perceiving, all-seeing witness. This is not something very abstract. Now, uh, then what about drishyam? These are two words you say. Dr dr drishya viveka. So drashta is the one who sees, the one who, um, who, is, who, who perceives. Then drishyam is an object. And that changes. It is not a witness, it is the object. The drashta 
the seer, the perceiver, the witness never changes. It remains the same. And he never falls sick. It is, it, it is present in all of us as the divine spark. We frequently fail to identify ourselves with that. So when, when an unpleasant thing happens to us, we identify ourselves as the one who experiences that unpleasant experience. So that unpleasant experience actually uh, enters our mind. Our mind and personality takes the form of that unpleasant, happy or unhappy experience, whatever it may be. That if we can look upon ourselves as the one who perceives, who witnesses this, un uh, this unpleasant experience, let us see an example. This can be given from a very, very uh, psychological point of view. Suppose we feel, well, I'm losing my temper. Uh, well, suppose we can, uh, uh, well, well, I'm losing my temper. Well, this awareness comes from not the I who is, lo who, who is losing the temper, another I. If you can witness your own, yourself losing your own temper, or you can witness your own anger, your own emotions, then you, won't, you are no more angry. Because when you witness as a non-participating witness, then you do not identify yourself with your anger. Then anger becomes a subject, and we look at our own anger. We analyze our own anger. Then anger runs away. If anger or emotion or any emotions or feelings are subjected to our own analysis, a thorough understanding, that anger is gone. So that's what happens when we meditate, really. When we meditate, at least for the time being, we are transcending our mind. So we can, so we can witness many emotions and ideas emerging in the mind. And if you identify with them, you are lost. If you fight with them, then also you are lost. But if you see them at, from a distance, mentally, as a subject, not as, as a person who is playing in the drama, but the one who witness, who sits in an armchair in the gallery, who is witnessing the drama, you may, one may uh, uh, perhaps identify with the grief and sorrow, happiness or unhappiness uh, played out by an actor on the stage. But that is only for the time being. You know, when you come out again, you are happy. Because, you know, it's a drama. Like that, if we can observe and witness as a subject, as a non-participating subject, our own anger, our own happiness, our own unhappiness, then happiness and unhappiness will come and go. We won't be affected. It doesn't mean insensitivity or anything, really speaking. It doesn't mean that you can run away, you become indifferent. Not at all. In fact, uh, Vedanta, Vedanta philosophy is not a kind of uh, ultra-subjective idealism. It, it is as realistic as idealistic. As we enter the subject, we'll understand this. So this text tells you that you should stop identifying yourself with the object, the seen, the perceived objects, and you should start identifying yourself as the perceiver, the subject. Once we do that, we will have no problems. So uh, this is the nature of the text. And in the process, you find six types of samadhi or concentration are described in this text. This text is well known, uh, as I mentioned earlier. It's a very condensed, it's very small book, actually. There are bigger prakarana granthas, as we understand. We call it primers or introductory texts, like Panchadeshi, which is quite big. But this is very small. Even Viveka Chudamani is quite big, 485 verses. And this one, 585 verses, the latest version. And this one, only 46. It's a very tiny book. So that is one important subject. Analysis of the seer, the subject, and the scene and the object. The second, the description of the 
types of concentrations we call samadhis. As we enter, we will understand. It's all practical methods which we can employ in our own life. And, uh, and the third important uh, subject discussed in the course of this text is a very, very philosophical uh, analysis and description of uh, the concept of jiva, the embodied soul. The all-pervading Atman of Brahman uh, as an indweller present in all of us. So, three schools, Avachedavada and Bimba Pradibhambavada and Abhasavada. These are the technical terms used in the course of discussion. It becomes clear. We have only five classes. So, we have to remember, we have to focus on only certain aspects of this. But it deals with the different schools of Vedanta, like uh, Bhamadi school, you know, Vivarana school, and uh, the Vartika school, these are all these are discussed. So, I, will, I would like to enter the text straight away. Uh, the first uh, verse I will deal with and then explain. The first verse is this. And that's why that's, that's, that introduces the, the a subject object analysis. Rupam drishyam lochanam druk tad drishyam tattus manasam drishya di vrtaya sakshi drgeva natu drishyate. So this is the verse. I shall just uh, give a simple English translation and explain. Now, what it says is this. Drishyate in Sanskrit mean, it means drishyate, the one which is seen. That's called drishyam, but is seen. So it says, you may see different flowers, uh, papers, different objects outside. Flowers which are red, white, blue, yellow, and so on. So you find change uh, with regard to objects with your eyes. You see red flower now. After some time, you, you see white flower and uh, blue flower and so on. These are all objects. So they're all objects. They change. So when you see a flower, who is the scene? The flower is the scene, the object. Eyes constitute the seer. The eye sees the flower. Now you see the red flower, white flower, green flower, and so on, different objects, skies, blues, and so on. So the objects are not the same. But with the same eyes, the same subject, see, you see various types of flowers. So the seer is unchanging. And the scene, the objects are changing. Now, what about the mind? With regard to mind, mind is the seer, eyes are the scene. Because without the mind's presence, you may stare at certain things, you won't be seeing them. Suppose I look at that photo, but if I'm concentrating my mind on something else, I may be seeing the photo, but I may be looking at the photo, but I may not be perceiving the photo. Because perception at the visual level is possible only with the mind and the sense of sight come together. Then you interpret the form for what it is. It is a photo, it is a white flower, blue flower, and so on. So here, mind is the subject, the eyes, the object. With regard to the flower, eyes are the subject, and flowers are the objects. Now, going beyond that, suppose your ability to an analyze, which is result related to intellect, cognitive faculty, is not very good your mind may be trying to uh, analyze or pursue an object with your eyes, but still you are not able to correctly cognize what you see. So, if, so the intellect should be 
the subject with regard to the mind which again becomes the subject with regard to the flower now another question how does the intellect or mind uh, pursue things uh, see uh, a person who is a, in whom the atman is not present something which he cannot normally uh, interpret in terms of modern psychology but it is a real rea the reality within is not present then mind and intellect and eyes cannot interpret and cognize and pursue the flower in front of us so the real seer subject is atman if the atman withdraws from the body which we call death what happens in death death is nothing but the withdrawal of this divine spark from this body mind intellect mechanism when that at the divine reality that we cannot see with our eyes withdraws itself from this body mind complex then mind and intellect and eyes any of the senses of perception they all become incapable of any kind of functions so who is a real seer the atman now if we can at least intellectually identify ourselves with this all seeing subject then that vedanta uh, takes another uh, turn vedanta becomes a very practical way of living in this world and what sri ramakrishna puts in simple language this idea you put in your pocket that's what he says and live in this world you cannot always go about saying i am the atman if you are in that level of consciousness that you won't be able to drive in the streets you won't be able to go for shopping you won't be able to do anything or you won't be able to invest money in the bank in which is very very important in modern times so the point is even while doing or uh, doing all these functions still somewhere within a corner of our mind if we can keep this idea this atman there is something in me that's go that goes beyond body mind and intellect that's all seeing witness then we will have a higher opinion of ourselves beyond our understanding at the physical mental intellectual level so that is an important contribution of this book so how to do that vedanta gives some very simple uh, ideas this idea that we are the atman we are the all pervading reality may sound a bit too remote is a kind of abstract concept lying somewhere hanging above clouds it may look like that frequently vedanta is wrongly interpreted as some kind of life negating uh, idealism now the same order shankaracharya in other books says it may look very remote and very distant but there is a door opening right in front of you you open the door you can enter the freeway the highway that is guaranteed to take you all the way to the experience level of this now it's a concept now it's an idea but we can find this really happening in our life and that is whatever we do whatever actions whatever duties whatever obligations we perform if we perform all this with the full conviction that it is necessary but there is something other than this physical the worldly enjoyments worldly results if we can detach our mind from extreme obsession for the results desires and go about living in this world then one day we will reach that goal any unselfish noble action or feeling will prepare the, our mind gradually to the to the realization of this ideal right now it may look very 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 abstract but 
there is a higher spiritual dimension to a personality drishya dhi vrtaya sakshi what it says so the mind with all its modification vrtis it is only a sakshi it is a perceiver with a regard to visual objects and eyes because the mind is the seer with regard to eyes and eventually the objects also become the objects for the eyes and eyes become the objects for the mind and mind and intellect become objects for the seer for the atman for the real drashta or that is called drik drishya vivek this is a brief introduction to the text now <clears throat> i shall explain uh, a few very important uh, subjects in this if those who are interested you can remember this the 20th verse what i discussed now is the first one this is the 20th one this 20th verse it tells you that in everything in this world there are two aspects the absolutely real and the uh, relative so that should be understood everything in this world so for example whatever you see in this world in in our own body if you look at the body of any human beings there is one part of our physical or psychological personality which is eternal which is the absolute reality the other is only relative that eternal reality is designated in vedanta asti bhati and priya asti bhati and priya asti means the absolute existence that it always exists we certainly cannot be this body not this worldly matter they change but behind all this there is one divine reality present it is the existence so uh, it says the existence aspect when it joins other things they get existence so the existence itself is absolute it is the existent aspect called sat in vedanta that gives existence to everything so that is asti bhati actually means that is effulgence it becomes cognizable shines effulgence priya means ananda so when we uh, when we look at the world of realities vedanta uh, analyzes the concept of reality for from four different perspectives and this is very this also very important even in practical life according to vedanta the highest reality the absolute reality the unchanging reality the eternal reality is beyond all changes beyond all uh, all um, modifications so and it is birthless it is deathless how can something which is unborn be eternal it always exists so it can never take birth birth is nothing but transition from a state of non existent empirical non existence into existence we call birth and death is nothing but empirical disappearance atman is one or pervading reality present everywhere it is unchanging it is unwavering it is beyond modifications it is vedanta is called paramarthika satta or the absolute reality and this seer this all pervading reality the atman is the absolute reality that's how true nature everything else changes the body changes the the cells undergo changes mind changes now mind is happy next moment is unhappy 
but there is something beyond this mind which remains the same. If we can somehow link ourselves to this absolute reality, the spiritual dimension of our true nature, then we we can become calm and quiet. So in the Gita you find who is a healthy-minded person, who is a spiritually enlightened person. Siddha prajna, siddha prajna, yes, yes, sir, siddha prajna. Who is a person with his mind fully in place, in his proper place? Healthy-minded person. A healthy-minded person is one who has linked his to my his mind to a transcendental focus, Atman. because mind at mental level is never stable mind is mind becomes happy when it gets something which it desires for and becomes unhappy when it loses that so mind can never be always in a perpetual state of contentment but suppose you you link your mind to something which never wavers which never changes then mind becomes stable So it is called in under Kathopani said there is an imagery. The whole human life is compared to a journey, a travel on a chariot. It is called Ratha Rupa Kalpana. I mean the imagery of life interpreted as a journey on a chariot. Now when when you travel in a chariot, the horses should be with under your control under the control of the rider and you should be able to sit properly on the carriage for that the road should be clear the horses should be perfectly disciplined and the rider should be capable of controlling the horses so id atmanam ridhiram vidhi shariram ridham evacha buddhin tu saradhim vidhi mana pragraham evacha indriyani paranyahu vishayan sthishu gojaran atmendriya mano yuktam bhokte tyahur manishina ka this is the anyway don't worry about the slogans just i shall explain it don't worry about it the the journey is simple who is a, who is what is our life our life is a journey and the individual soul is the person who has hired this carriage now the rider the driver of the carriage should be a very stable person and then only he will be able to control the horses if he is a drunk if he is fully drunk he will, he won't be able to control the horses with the reins so he should be stable okay now that the rider the driver of the horses is intellect buddhin tu saradhim vidhi he is the intellect okay now what about the reins with which the driver of the carriage controls the horses mind so mind should be stable and who are the horses our eyes our ears our sense of touch sense of smell sense of taste the five senses of perception are the horses now if you ever listen to the dictates of our senses of perception if we go after whatever our eyes drag our mind into then we are lost if we if we go after whatever our sense of smell or sense of test or sense of taste drag our mind into then also we are lost so the rider of the horses should have the reins in his mind firmly held by his hands so mind should be stable mind should be controlled by a wise buddhi the rain should be stable in the hands of the rider of the chariot then the horses become disciplined then horses will listen to the dictates of the mind and mind will be controlled by a stable intellect and then what happens the person traveling 
in the in the chariot will reach its destination safely but suppose the other way around the horses are totally indisciplined they they take your chariot wherever they want you take it and the reins are broken and the rider is unstable then you won't reach your destination like that if we can link our senses properly to the sense of perception and that senses of perception eyes etc are properly linked to a stable mind and the mind is linked to atman then our life journey becomes very simple and stable this can be applied in our everyday life as i mentioned earlier whenever we uh, whenever emotions or feelings or ex- uh, or excitements take over our life if we can wait for a moment what's my true nature i am at this physical body this mind and intellect do i have a higher dimension to my nature at least intellectually if we can uh, think of this higher transcendent dimension of a personality then what happens you know we will be able to stay away from the flow of our own emotions and we will be able to watch our emotions we will be able to observe and analyze our emotions and remember when emotions are subjected to analysis they become completely controlled friendly that's an interesting thing it's just like you know, when you understand you have a problem then problems become less lesser problems it's just like when you drive in a in the freeway when you are when you know very well that there is a 10 10 minutes half an hour delay ahead then when you reach that point you are no more shocked really you take it part of your game so like that when we have this strong conviction that we have a transcendent dimension which is our true nature which never feels any kind of anxiety any kind of problems any kind of stress which is a real thing then what happens you know we will be able to witness our own emotions we will be able to stay outside the flow of our own emotions and we'll watch our emotions when emotions are watched and observed they become controlled when we are aware of that problem there are no more problems and this we do when we identify ourselves with this absolute reality is called atman so what what we how to explain this atman in modern english well all that we can say is this it is one spiritual reality present in all of us it is what makes our life really worth living it is present everywhere it is present in everything when we feed our mind with good spiritual food instead of feeding our mind with poisonous worldly food worldly ideas if we can refine our mind keep feeding our mind with good ideas good thoughts then slowly our mind becomes ready to transcend itself to identify this absolute reality that is paramarthika satta in vedanta you need not even believe in a creator god to understand this once you understand this then you will become a truly religious person spiritual person so people the great mystics in all religious traditions in one way or other always realize this in different cultures different traditions they use different vocabulary so this is paramarthika satta then what about this world in which we live so vedanta gives a very interesting analysis of this vedanta says that this world is not unreal in the absolute sense but it is not real in the absolute sense either it is not real certainly maybe uh, billions of years back this world was not there and maybe after several billions of years this world will not be the the way it is today so it is a fact of modern science which everyone can understand changes are natural in everything 
at the empirical level. There is nothing in the empirical world that doesn't change, that goes on changing. So whatever changes, whatever undergoes modifications, according to Vedanta, is not unreal in the absolute sense, but not real in the absolute sense. It is called relative. That's what we call Vyavaharika Satta, means the relative reality, the empirical reality, the phenomenal reality. We don't deny it, but then we don't consider it as absolutely real. So the Vedanta psychology, tells, Advaita psychology tells you all the problems we face in the world are rooted in one single mistake. We interpret the relate you to be the absolute reality. We mistake the Vyavaharika for the Paramarthika. We misinterpret, wrongly interpret the changing relative uh, entities, phenomenal objects to be absolute realities. That's what happens. So it's something like the, the archetypal story that appears in modern books. See, a, a, a person who travels maybe from here to Sunnyvale or San Jose gets caught in a traffic jam and he's, maybe he's heading to the airport and he gets excited because he's worried uh, that he may not reach the airport or his destination on time. But this anxiety, this worry will not take him there one minute earlier. The only result is you can pay a, a little more money to the doctor, the, the health, a, 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 or you can, uh, you can enrich the pharmaceutical people. That's all. <laughs> because the, the anxiety level, stress level, the, uh, this, this um, diabetes aggravates, that's the only thing. Because anxiety and worry uh, do not take you one minute earlier to the destination. So what's the use of it? That's what exactly Vedanta tells you. You don't look upon this relative world to be the absolute. I would tell you, surprisingly, very often this aspect of Vedanta is never very often discussed. Basically, I've spent all my lifetime Right from my early, I don't mention this, if people know, from fifth year up to my long year, studying the Veda, the scriptures, in the old traditional way, memorizing the Bharshyas, Vartikas, and so on. Now, when I learned this, actually, I never understood this aspect of Vedanta. So, the Advaita philosophy has got a very, very practical application. If you can look upon this empirical, relative, changing, phenomenal world as the empirical, relative, changing, phenomenal world and not the absolute, then most of our problems will be gone. Vedanta tells you, you should be level-headed. Don't expect this changing world to be the unchanging world. So traditional Vedantic classics may not be able to relate this aspect of Vedanta. But there is already there in Vedanta philosophy. That is, one should not expect this imperfect world to be perfect. One should not expect this changing world to be unchanging. So you should understand Vyavaharika Satta as Vyavaharika Satta. That's the idea behind. So this is second level of relativity. So what I mentioned, Asti Bhati Priyam, existence, knowledge, and bliss absolute constitute the, the Paramarthika, the absolute reality, the Atman within us. And then, you know, na, <coughs> Rupam nama, Namam Chapanchakam. Rupam means form and Nama means names. So Vedanta tells you the whole world is nothing but just a, just a structure composed of different entities and because their forms are different, they assume different names. So from gold you may make a ring, a necklace, many ornaments you may make. From clay you may make pots, pans, glasses, jars. Their shapes are different. So you cannot use the same name to call everything. You have to use small 
clay cups are called cups big pots are called pots so names are different because forms are different that vedanta tells you the whole phenomenal empirical world is nothing but the absolute reality seen and perceived through name and form so it's just like if you take gold to a goldsmith he may not worry about the workmanship if he is going to sell that ornaments he will judge it only on the basis of gold value because he going to melt everything into gold so nama and rupa are names and forms are immaterial for him like that when you reach this highest spiritual experience of advaita you live in this world but you are not caught by this world even by living in this world you can uh, see that you have a transcendental spiritual dimension that give that gives a kind of spiritual common sense that is the most elementary contribution of vedanta a spiritual common sense about life and world and that helps us to interact with the world and different persons in a more uh, in 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 more intelligent in a wiser manner so this is a very famous verse that means in the whole creation there is one absolute reality which can be understood as asti bhati and priya sachidananda which is unchanging which is the same everywhere and everything else constitutes the vyavaharika pratibhasika things i shall explain the the third category pradibhasika so pradibhasika means only conceptual realities conceptual entities so we have to remember the absolute reality atman the empirical reality vyavaharika and the conceptual reality that is that we are going to explain pradibhasika well for we have to use an old imagery to explain this i can't go through every verse in a traditional way so i'm putting in simple modern context so suppose in a room is a very old imagery that was repeated the first the first time this imagery was employed by buddhist philosophers in the second century bc uh, when the shunyavada thoughts were emerging which later culminated in madhyamika karya which in the 5th century ad 600 years later by nagarjuna anyway so the imagery is very simple let think of a room which is dimly lit with not enough light and there is a dark uh, rope lying on the floor so the ancient philosophers buddhist and mimamsakas and also vedantins later they say this uh, dark rope can resemble a snake because of the color and shape if there is not enough light in the room or that piece of rope can resemble a crack on the floor or a thin stream of water or a curved stick this are or a snake of course color of the snake these are four possible wrong interpretations called so that is sarpa bhuchidra danda jaladhara in the sanskrit language so anyway now uh, suppose you mistake that curved uh, piece of rope for a snake and you go out of the room you look for a stick to beat and kill the snake and in the process you bring a light also to make sure and then suddenly you realize the fact it is not a snake but a rope now the point is the snake is not there in that room but the snake is there somewhere else the snake is there in the memory in the mind of the person who mistook that rope for the snake because it is he remembers because he had seen a snake like that maybe in the zoo or in the forest or somewhere else and that memory is already there in his mind which he superimposes upon the piece of rope so the snake is not absolute unreality because it is there in the forest and also he remembers seeing it somewhere else 
So it's called the conceptual reality. This is a third category in the Vedantic analysis. We need not worry about it. We are concerned for the time being only with the empirical and the absolute. The fourth one is absolute unreality, which by the very name den denies its possibility. If you are interested in it, you can ask me questions during interaction. We will have half an hour interaction. So those of you who want to ask more questions, the traditional aspects of what we are discussing are most welcome to ask questions during the half an hour interaction in all the five sessions. So this slogan, this verse tells you everything in this world, whatever you see in this world has got the absolute reality, Atman present in everything, everywhere, the whole creation, which is unchanging, the same everywhere, and also the changing empirical phenomenal things. Both are there. If we can always remember that this world, by its very nature, this empirical world is bound to be like this, cannot change, was always like this, and will never be anything other than what it is now, then we will not be bothered by anything. That's one spiritual common sense that Ved Advaita Vedanta alone can tell you. All of the systems of philosophy will tell you God created this world in a fine morning and he told you this. That leaves a lot of scope for questions and logical refutations. But Vedanta tells you there is one su supreme spiritual truth in everything. And also there is the empirical thing. And there is a conceptual reality also in Peter. So now we will have interaction. You are most welcome to ask any question uh, related to this text or in Vedanta in general. Most welcome. Thank you. This body and this world, all this belong to the empirical. Yes, yes, no, but my question is different. Yeah. You say it's a transformation of reality. It is a? Transformation? It is not transformation. Really, these things undergo change. Every, <laughs> every day, every moment, these things change. So they are not absolute entities. They are not absolute realities but they are not absolutely unreal. They are changing phenomenal things. You mentioned the gold and the ring. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, yeah. The gold is supposed to be the Brahman, right? Yeah. In that particular illustration, in that particular illustration, uh, gold should be perceived to be more real than the ring, necklaces, etc. The a ring is nothing but the name of, the, sorry, the shape of the ring, mm -hmm. the round form, and a name imposed upon gold. Okay. And that is imposed by a goldsmith. Okay, but the body, and we see the material, yeah. uh, form, he, he, the name we see, that's yeah. not the same as the reality of Brahman. No, no. Because that is Satchidana. Yeah, yeah, that is Satchidana. This is empirical. Okay, okay, I tell you, I tell you, no, see, one, yeah, one yeah, yeah, no, remember, no, remember, so, the imagery in the illustration, uh, the gold stands for Brahman, but gold itself is not Brahman in the absolute category, you cannot have a, any, any illustration linked to Brahman, it's a Brahman cannot be brought down to any kind of illustration or imagery. So, we are taking an imagery from empirical world to drive home an idea. Just as gold is real compared to golden ring, so also Brahman is only reality and the whole universe, including gold, actually are changing things. But in the context of when you compare the golden ring and golden necklace to gold itself, then gold is more permanent and golden ring, golden necklaces, etc., changing things. But 
ये ब्रह्मन इट्सल्फ के नॉट बी कंपेयर टू एनी ऑब्जेक्ट फ्रॉम द एब्रिकल वर्ल्ड वेन यू यूज इलस्ट्रेशन और कंपेरिजन और इमेजरीज यू कैन टेक इलस्ट्रेशन ओनली फ्रॉम द वर्ल्ड सो गोल्ड बाय इट सेल्फ इज पार्ट ऑफ द चेंजिंग फिनोमल वर्ल्ड बट वेन यू कंपेयर गोल्ड टू गोल्ड विथ अदर गोल्डन ऑर्नमेंट्स देन वॉट हैपन्स यू नो बिटवीन दम गोल्ड इज मोर रियल you follow the point so, okay okay now no, i follow that point ah yeah the, so so the you know the, so what what i want to tell you is brahman itself can never be brought down to the level of any kind of illustration atman or brahman can be realized only as uh, as a real experience even the sachidananda do not constitute a definition of brahman it is only approximation to understand brahman brahman can never be verbalized can never defined can never be explained so one important point that advaita philosophers stress again and again is this atman is atma vidya knowledge of brahman is anubhavika vidya means it can only be experienced can never be explained it is beyond verbalization it is beyond definition beyond description but in philosoph philosophical books when we explain we take illustrations from various entities in the world same example is taken for example waves and ocean it is like that ocean is more real ocean as an entity is more real compared to waves ebbs because bubbles of water you know they are coming and going but the ocean remains the same but the ocean itself from the from the highest point of view it's part of the changing world so the examples are take always taken from empirical world you follow brahman can never be equated with any kind of illustrations or examples this particular example either rope snake analogy or gold golden ornaments analogy can apply only as an approximation it is used only to explain the uh, the the fundamental uh, reality of gold only even compared to golden ornaments remember remember the fundamental reality the unchanging nature of gold stands it it can be understood only when you compare it with the changing forms of golden ornaments but gold itself is part of the empirical which always changes follow the point it is in science in vedanta is called idare dara bheda between them there are differences but the highest level brahman is only reality which can never be brought down to any kind of analogy illustration or imagery so how you see yourself in the the, the world is brahman yeah so all human beings are nothing but embodiments of the atman embodiment means the atman reflecting in the human individual self you you will explain here yeah, already explained we are going to explain there are three schools explaining this i already have said avada bimba pradimba vada and abhasa vada which we are going to explain in the coming verses that's an important part of this text three ways of explaining embodiment jiva jivatva jivatva kalpana the three examples which will explain it so also precise this can i ask another question yeah you can ask perhaps perhaps you know now uh, because we have only half an hour you can ask later if there any other questions from yeah then we will come back to you okay thank you well, come on yeah mm, thank you very much for explaining uh, about the soul uh, the mind and the body yeah. uh, and the objects itself so the question i have is uh, you mentioned that the mind is the controller and the um, object you are seeing is the control um then why is it that people say that for example when you eat food uh, which is in my opinion an object mm. uh, that can control the mind the nature of the food that you eat yeah. has an effect on the mind i will explain so first i clarify the point that you raised first you know what i said was compared to physical objects like flowers mountains valleys which we see with our eyes eyes are the seer the subject these objects are trishya these are the eyes of drishta 
compared to the mind eyes equation mind is the subject the drashta the seer and eyes are objects again going beyond that without the atman being present as a witness mind cannot function as subject in its in its relation to the eyes so that is the first point i declare second this is a direct question so i think that point is clear the second question is see whatever food we eat it has got two dimensions one is sukshma the other is thula sukshma is the invisible sthula is very physical and visible see for example when you eat food when you eat food uh, if it is it is if it is unhygienic you fall sick and uh, it will immediately affect the body but if you eat the best hygienic food given by a person with a curse behind it and your mind suddenly gets disturbed and you may be the person who gave you that food is obviously not your well wisher you should know very well you will be slightly disturbed when you eat the mind so there is something connected to that food which is not hygienic it is perfectly organic food but given by a person who curses you hates you you know that very well so something happens in your mind and that what happens to your mind will have a very very scientifically verifiable effect on the hormones and signs or with which you digest the food so that is sukshma aspect the subtle aspect okay no similarly suppose you get food which is not not unhygienic but certainly not of a high quality but given by a loving grandmother and you you know she loves you so much and you also love her okay that would have a positive effect in fact the emotional connection itself will have very demonstrable scientific uh, manifestations the emotions enzymes and all that when our mind you know our mental emotions we have direct impact on the body system it really speaking that's we you know everyone everyone knows these days psychosomatic concept so that invisible uh, sattvic or non sattvic element is sukshma that's why food has a serious um, uh, impact on the mind i would tell you well going one step beyond i would tell you one important way to uh, to solve many of the problems in many modern societies western societies especially then is becoming everywhere global phenomenon is is though you may be eating the best food but eating the best food having the best physical health you become demons you can have a lot of violence organic food doesn't guarantee good mind but food fed by good loving people will guarantee a positive mind that is a sukshma or subtle aspect of what we eat again another interpretation is food is not only what we eat food is also what we feed your mind with so here that aspect is there here from a physical empirical point of view what you eat is perfect food balanced diet organic and uh, well uh, you in all the uh, advertisements you can use in the organic gmo free all that <laughs> but then the person's mind becomes poisonous so that's one uh, a proof of the the subtle aspect of food and then so that works both for good and bad it's clear to you that is annamayam pranamana it is statement decided in the chandogya upanishad so mind mind means uh, pra, um, and uh, vital energies they are composed of food is a statement okay any other question madam ah please what do you mean by absolute unreality yeah i should explain so in vedantic uh, philosophy the absolute you mean what do you mean by question absolute uh, you said absolute unreality oh yeah that's right absolute unreality means even when you utter that it becomes obviously impossible an impossibility even a hypothetical impossibility so vedanta gives some examples is called sacha vishana means 
horns of a hare. You know, hare cannot have horns. If if an animal has got horns, it could be some other animal, not hare. So, if it's for example, Gandharva Nagar, I mean, city about the sky, the clouds, about the clouds. These are some of the examples given in ancient Vedantic text, which, uh, for examples, were hypothetical, conceptual impossibilities. It is given as an example. It is again, you know, an example of asat, what it means absolute and realities. Even if you utter it, it it becomes a self contradiction. An example of uh, I of things which are not even conceivable. That's the idea behind. Okay, okay. right. So this uh, whole concept of seer being different from the seen, or the yeah. lower being different yeah. from the yeah. known. Yeah. Yeah. You go back to let's say the absolute exist, um, the absolute consciousness, which is the knower hmm. of the rest of the things that is known. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, you know, avidya, avidya is anadi and sanda. That is a Vedantic interpretation. Avidya is avidya is no beginning, but it comes to an end when you get realization. Now the coming to the, I shall explain that one. You know, it is like asking when did the snake enter the room? When you bring light, immediately. The snake vanishes. So, this it is only snake idea that vanished from your mind. The snake never ran away from the room. It was not dead to begin with. So, so I, I shall explain. So, avidya is explained is navidya de iti avidya. That which doesn't exist is avidya. You may ask a question if you are trained in a nyaya. You see. When you when you say he is not there, okay, it, it is not uh, it is it is not total a total impossibility that he could be there. There's a chance that this person may be there. That's why you have to say he is not there. What is obviously unreal, you don't deny, and what is obviously real, you cannot deny. So Shankaracharya in Bhashya makes a great statement. You know, aprasaktasya aprasaktasya ka prastava ka aprasaktasya ko nishedha ka prasaktasya ko ka prastava ka prasaktasya ko nishedha. You know what it means? What is obviously real, which is not everyone. Obviously, it is real. You cannot deny. You don't deny that, and you don't make a statement about it. What is real? As real is obvious to everyone, you don't make a statement. You don't make a statement because such a statement is totally un uh, unnecessary, and you cannot make a statement because it will be the negation of truth. And what is obviously real, you cannot uh, state, make a statement. You cannot affirm. You cannot deny. What is obviously unreal, also you cannot affirm, but you don't have to deny. So in this context, there is a possibility that these golden rings could be mistaken, golden ornaments, or maybe clay utensils, pots and pans and glasses made of clay, could be misunderstood and misinterpreted to be totally different from the clay from which it is made. So the Upanishad makes in Vacharam Banam Vikaro Namadhyam. Murtiga ittiva satyam. You know what Dubanisha says? All the clay pots, pans, glasses, jars made of clay, their vacha arambana means vacha alambana. These are all different manifestations of forms and names. They are intrinsically not different from the clay. But the question arises when did the wrong understanding come? The wrong understanding came because of your ignorance. Where did it arise? First of all, when you get out of avidya, you understand there is no point in asking this question. When you are within avidya, then your question will not be answered. 
So that is why Maya and Avidya are often equated. Maya, Ma in Sanskrit, when you use the word Ma Gachudu, Ma Vadudu, Ma Gachudu means don't come here, don't go there. It is used to negate, you know, don't go there, Ma Vadudu, don't, don't speak Ma Vadudu, etc. Means you are negating. Ya, yeah, you know what Ya? Yeah? Ya yeah is a pronoun. You don't use a pronoun except there is something to refer to. He is the, there should be a human being. Then only you can use the word he or she. So, ya refers to a possibility. Ma negates it. So, maya or avidya is something beyond description. When you are within maya and avidya, you cannot understand that it is unreal. When you are out of it, then you don't feel this question is worth asking. Okay, thank you. Yeah, come on. This is a technical question. Okay? Yeah. Maybe yeah. I will, I will, I shall, uh, you know, in the, uh, I shall try to um, uh, give to the very root of this uh, use of words, you know. Now, uh, in, the, in the Vedic literature from which all these uh, Upanishads come, you know, there was a time when philosophy was highly evolved. Language was not so highly evolved. So you find the word Atma is used in the ancient Vedic text to mean indriya's senses, individual soul, mind, intellect, parama, the universal soul. In all these different contexts, the word Atman is used in the texts. So Bhashyakara tried to make this point very clear in the Bhashya in different contexts through explanations. So Atman is nothing but the immanent dimension or when you explain the absolute reality as the immanent what you call under riyami the one is the indweller in everything and everywhere then you use it atman as the as the absolute reality divine reality present in everything everywhere as the immanent indweller brahman is the word used uh, to explain the same Atman as the all-pervading reality and as the source of everything. The same reality when explained as immanent indweller present in all of us, as the divine reality present in all of us, the word Atman is used. And the same reality may be called Brahman when it is used to mean as the source of the whole creation, as the source of origin, existence, and dissolution of the whole creation, as the all-pervading reality, the word Brahman may be used. But you have to remember, in the original Vedic text, in the Samhita, Aranya, Brahmana, and also Upanishads especially, these words are interchangeable. So that's why Shankaracharya wrote these marvelous commentaries to explain this in the light of Advaita Vedanta, non dualistic philosophy. Yeah. When we talk about this empirical existence, the Atma, the mind over it, hmm. why is it that the Atma goes through this? What is the Atma? Yeah. Actually, due to our wrong perception, we are going through these interpretations. So, see, for example, we are coming to that. Uh, the subject later, this, uh, this, the absolute reality, the Atman is often explained, its connection, its relationship with the embodied jiva is explained in the light of one particular uh, imagery in Vedanta, it's called the Bimba Pradivimba Vada, means the, the prototype reflection analysis, analogy. The sun blazing above our heads, let's say a thousand pots with water and sun above. So you, can, you, have, you, can, you have got the real sun and a thousand reflections. So uh, we, when, we, when we do not 
realize our true nature when we misinterpret ourselves to be this body mind intellect etc we wrongly understand atman as the body mind intellect etc through spiritual practices through vedantic discussions through you know shravana manana nidhi dhyasana etc through this uh, spiritual practices when we realize that we have a that our true nature is this all pervading reality then it's just like breaking the pot and emptying the water then what have you know what happened to the reflection on the pot it's gone because it was not there it did not have an independent existence independent of the real sun then when we realize that that's our true nature then the question doesn't arise another point to remember is vedanta doesn't begin with a creationist theory what vedanta tells you is you open around look at the world with your eyes and try to analyze its true nature so when you study the world and when you study and its nature even when you believe it is the absolute reality at the beginning of your you know philosophical studies when you really analyze the nature of the world you will understand well it cannot be absolute reality it's changing every day mind is changing every day intellect is changing every day and what undergoes changes and modifications cannot be the absolute reality so there is something which is said vikara atida beyond the six changes so vedanta begins with an analysis of the effect it doesn't begin with the an explanation of the cause it is un- unscientific and irrational scientific inquiry begins with the analysis of the effect and when you look at this world with the effect and understand its nature then you understand it cannot be the absolute reality it can be only empirical thing so if there, there is if it is empirical thing there should be an, a non empirical a transcendental supreme reality behind it that's how vedanta reaches brahma vidya okay thank you um so, uh, so um when we talk about uh when we try to make sense of our what we're experiencing is our existence um we think in linear terms and yeah. we talk we talk about you know uh the mater- the relative relative reality having a beginning and an end yeah. and absolute reality we talk about is something that's just always been there and and yeah. relative reality is a projection of that that thing that has always been there and has no beginning or end yeah. but um and we also think of relative reality as something that de- derives its its you know false reality from from absolute reality yeah. but is that could it go the other way could could it be that absolute reality also depends on rel- relative reality and it could be could it be that uh relative reality yeah. actually has no beginning or end it yeah. just sort of loops yeah 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 vedanta tells you there is only one reality in the true sense of the term that is what you call absolute reality the so called relative reality is reading of the absolute in relative terms so vedantic teachers give this marvelous interpretation you know that is this world is nothing but the reading of brahman the absolute reality or interpretation of the absolute reality through the prism of maya maya is nothing but time space causation uh, structure when you look at the absolute reality through the eyes of relativity then you have this relative world you don't see the absolute so long as you see the the relative the absolute doesn't exist for you and when you see the absolute you understand the relative to be the relative and then you understand the relative cannot have an ontological existence independent of the absolute so vedanta the interpreters tell you even god you know popular hindu theistic systems shiva vishnu all in different deities or abrahamic concepts of monotheistic god created god all real 
no doubt about it vedanta doesn't say any of these concepts are unreal or wrong what it says is when you evolve in your own spiritual life then your concept of your understanding of the absolute also evolves just as when you join the uh, primary school you have one and one understanding of physics or whatever subject you study when you became a professor you don't deny what you studied in the primary school that's a foundation but you go beyond it so that is a very interesting aspect of vedanta vedanta is an all accommodating all inclusive one without a second so it doesn't say that any other view is wrong or imperfect what it says is when you evolve in our spiritual life then our understanding of the absolute also grows so that's why there are many verses in the text uh, in the bhagavata and other puranas we tell you at the beginning we believe god lives in a temple and uh, when you evolve in a spiritual life then you feel the presence of god not only inside the temple but everywhere so it's not that god, god doesn't live in the temple any longer no what you you accept it but when you grow in spiritual life then you realize god is present in the temple god is present outside the temple also there is no way where god is not present so the relative is only transcended when you realize the absolute the relative is never negated so those of you who want who want uh, the scriptural statements related to this are most welcome to ask question in the next class okay thank you Om Shanti 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 Hari Hi Om Tat Sat Sri Ram Krishna Arpanamastu